Well, hello. Uh, welcome to this uh, conversation about multi-factor authentication. Uh, thank you very, very much for attending. Um, let's start. Uh, let's talk first about a definition for MFA. So MFA is uh, it stands for multi-factor authentication. Uh, also is called two-factor authentication because most of the implementations are based on two factors. Uh, it's also called 2FA, two-factor authentication and other similar terms. It's an electronic authentication method in which a user is granted access to a device, a website or an application only after successfully presenting two or more pieces of evidence, those are factors, to an authentication mechanism. Uh, there are different types of, puzzle, of factors. Uh, not uh, each one of these can be uh, required more than once. Usually it's only one, but uh, according to the configuration, it can be more than one. Uh, the most common is knowledge, is something that the, only the user knows. Uh, the second is possession, something only the user has. And inheritance, something only the user is. So multifactor authentication protects data, which may include personal identification of financial assets from being accessed by a unauthorized third party that may have been able to discover, for example, a single password. Uh, we will explain uh, the most common uses of MFA today and how MFA is being implemented in our environment, research computing. Uh, knowledge. Knowledge factors are a form of authentication. In this form, the user is required to prove knowledge of a secret in order to authenticate. A password is a secret word or a string of characters that is used for, a use, for user authentication. This is the most commonly used mechanism of, of authentication today and, and, and in the past. Many multi-factor authentication techniques rely on passwords as one of the factors for authentication. Variations include, include both, both longer ones for, from multiple, multiple words, a passphrase, or uh, the shorter, uh, purely numeric, for example, a PIN or personal identification number, commonly used for ATM access. Traditionally, passwords are expected to be memorized. Possession. Possession factors, something only the user has, has been used for authentication for centuries in the form of a key to a lock. Uh, only the person who has the key can open the lock. The basic principle is that the key embodies a secret that is shared between the lock and the key. And the same principle underlies possession factor authentication in computer systems. A security token is an example of a possession factor. Uh, there are, for example, disconnected tokens that have no connection to the to the client to the client computer uh, that is accessing the system or or a website or application. They typically use a built-in screen to display the generated authentication data which is manually typed by the user. This type of token uh, uses a OTP, a one-time password, that can be used in, 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 for that specific session. So as the name says, it's one-time password. It can, be, it can be used only once. And usually these OTPs also have a very short life. So if you don't use uh, this password, uh, it will expire in usually in 60 seconds. So if a hacker has access to this number, to this OTP, 
he's not going to be able to do much unless he can do it within the time frame. Um, these two uh, photographs can show you two types of uh, these disconnected tokens. One is, uh, it, it was very common a few years ago, the secure ID, um, which generates a number every 60 seconds, whether you use the number or not. You, 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 you don't need to, to, to ask the token to generate a number. It will generate a number every 60 seconds. Uh, the photo on the right is a screenshot of a cellular phone, uh, which is using Duo. Uh, in this case, uh, it's generating a passcode. And this passcode is a one-time password. Possession, connected tokens, as opposed to the disconnected tokens that we were talking previously, are devices that are physically connected to the computer to be used. Those devices transmit data automatically. Uh, there are a number of different types, uh, including USB tokens, smart cards, and wireless, wireless tags. And the one in the, in, in the photo is, call a YubiKey. Basically, you connect the YubiKey to your computer, the client computer, and it, it will transmit uh, encrypted data to the server, proving that uh, you have the factor, because remember that this factor is possession. If you have the factor, uh, you are uh, allowed, at least you have uh, completed this factor. There are also uh, USB tokens that are to the plain side, they seem to be a flash memory, but, but they are actually a token. You have to connect the token to the client computer and the client computer will transmit data that is inside that token and will authenticate you. Inherent. These factors are associated with the user and are usually biometric methods, including fingerprinting, uh, face, voice, and uh, iris recognition. Today, it's very common in, 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 in smartphones to use fingerprint to access the, your, your smart device. Even in, in many laptops today, they have a, a fingerprint uh, reader. So uh, also very common today is face recognition. Uh, so you just put your, your smartphone in front of you and the smartphone will recognize you that you are the person, the owner of the phone. Uh, also there are voice recognition and iris recognition is, is also used. It's basically, you will read your eye and you will uh, find that you are the person authorized to, to access. Uh, Multi-factor authentication also has application in physical security systems. Uh, these physical security systems are known and commonly referred as to access control. Multi-factor authentication is typically deployed in access control systems through the use, firstly, of a physical possession, so, 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 such as a POP or FOB, a key card, or sometimes it's a QR code displayed on a, on a smart device, which acts as the identification credential. And second, a validation of one, one's identity such as facial biometrics or retinal scan. This multifactor authentication is commonly referred to as facial verification or facial authentication. Well, why is MFA important in IT security? Uh, this is a some example of very well-known password hacks. Uh, PlayStation in 2011, 77 million accounts hacked. 
The biggest one is Yahoo in 2014, three billion accounts. The B is a typo. Three billion account hacked. Basically, these are systems that most likely they were not properly hardened, and some hacker managed to to get the passwords and, and and the password were not also were not properly encrypted because they if they are properly encrypted it's very difficult that they can do anything with with after they hack the, the passwords uh, you can't stop a data breach but so Um, okay, we were talking about some power hacks. For example, Yahoo in 2014, 3 billion accounts. Basically, they force all the Yahoo users to, to change the password. So the question now is why passwords are easily hacked? Hackers have several methods to get, to, methods to get your password, such as social engineering, brute force, malware, phishing, among others. Social engineering, for example, is getting to know who are you, what are your preferences, your things. For example, if they know the name of your dog, it's probably that you are using the name of your dog as your password. So they just try to, to use several things, your birth date, your wedding date, uh, many, many things, the name of your wife, uh, many, many things that, that they, they begin to try one and another, another until they brought, eventually they manage to, to, to get your password. The other one is brute force. Brute force is also called a dictionary attack. It's also called, it's called dictionary attack because the hacker uses a dictionary with many, many thousands, millions of passwords, and they begin to, to apply one, the, the other, the other, the other, until one eventually works. Malware is when the hacker manages to plant some program in your computer via malware. They can send that, that malware in, in as a mail attachment or even when you are visiting a website, sometimes when you click uh, in a website, you, you, you download without knowing, you download a program that is uh, installed in your computer and it begins to, for example, do something that is called keylogger. Keylogger means that everything that you type is going to be transmitted to somewhere, uh, to someone somewhere. So this person, every time that you type your password, this person is going to be, is like uh, looking at your keyboard at the same time that you are uh, typing your password. Phishing, phishing is when a hacker sends you an email that apparently comes from a legitimate source, but it's not, for example, your bank. It's very common today that uh, you receive an email that says that your bank has been uh, frozen because there is some uh, misconfiguration in, in your account. So you must click here and uh, confirm your data. After confirming your data, your account will be released. It turns out that this email comes from a hacker. The hacker has created a, a website identical to the website of the bank. And many people, it's incredible, but many people believe that history. They connect to that site and they are giving the username and the password of their account. That, the, these are some of the different methods uh, among uh, that a hacker can be used to, to get your password. Basically, basically, if a hacker wants your password, they will get it one way or another. They will trick you to get your password somehow. 
So you can stop a data breach, but you can make your password less useful to hackers. How? With the use of multi-factor authentication. So even if someone gains access to your password, you still might be protected. We we here in Signet we uh, implemented we have been implementing multi-factor authentication for a couple of years now. And in the beginning, I remember we the staff of Signet we were using multi uh, two-factor authentication. We were using Google Authenticator in that moment. So, uh, some member of the team uh, we don't we still don't know how the hackers could get his password. And they use his password to get to CIDA, to RAM, to other uh, uh, systems uh, where he is a user. But when they try to get to, to Niagara, to our system, they couldn't. We, we were reading the, the, the logs in Niagara, and they were using the, the right password but they didn't get the second factor. So they never could uh, access Niagara because the second factor prevented the hacker to, to access the system. So most likely uh, uh, if, if the hacker has managed to get your password, uh, the second factor will protect you. The main benefit of uh, multi-factor authentication is that it will enhance your organization security by requiring users to identify themselves by more than just a username and a password. While important, username and passwords are vulnerable to brute force attacks and can be stolen by third parties, enforcing the use of a multi-factor authentication like a thumbprint or physical hardware Key means increased confidence that your organization will stay safe from cyber criminals. Okay, um, uh, let's talk about uh, multi-factor authentication here at the University of Toronto. Uh, the the uh, the, pro the name of the project is UTOR MFA. Basically, uh, it started about two years ago. Uh, the university did several proofs of concept. And at the end, uh, the university decided for Duo. Duo is a company uh, owned by Cisco. Uh, originally, it was an independent company, but it was purchased by Cisco a couple of years ago. Uh, and Duo is the provider uh, that was chosen by the University of Toronto. Uh, now, initially, it was a, a proof of concept, uh, but now, today, is the, the multi-factor authentication provider that the university uses for everybody. That includes staff and students. Uh, when uh, connecting to a U of T a website or system, uh, first the user will provide a username and a password as usual. And then the user will be prompted to provide a second factor. This uh, graphic here shows that the user may choose to provide an OTP, a one-time password. The one-time password is like the picture in, in, in the beginning of the presentation, uh, the, with the smartphone providing a, a number. So you can write the number in the passcode uh, field and you just click. In this case, uh, no data is being transmitted because the Duo app in your smartphone is generating an, a number every 60 seconds. And uh, that number, you just take the number, you type it here manually, and you click enter the passcode. There is no data transmission. The other option that is 
usually for most of the of us is send me a push. Send me a push implies data transmission. So uh, the web server or the system uh, authenticating the user sends a request to a duo server and the duo server sends, relies uh, uh, the request to your cell phone, directly to your cell phone. Your, in your cell phone, you are going to get a, a, a little noise notification and you just open the, the app and you approve that you are the person who are who is actually trying to access the system. So if you get a duo, a duo push without being accessing the system, it means that somebody is trying to, to access uh, uh, the system in your name. But if you are the one who is accessing the, the system, you get the, the notification in your cell phone, you just click approve, and then the cell phone will transmit that to the duo relay server, and the dual relay server will notify the system that the user has authenticated, authenticated successfully. That is the second factor. Mm. A multifactor authentication at the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. Uh, the Digital Alliance also shows uh, Duo as the multi-factor authentication provider. So the, the same company that the U of University of Toronto is using. Uh, the Digital Alliance uh, basically did uh, two proofs, proofs of concept between Duo, we have already spoken, it's a Cisco company, and the other uh, provider was Privacy Idea. Privacy Idea is an open source uh, system for doing basically the same than, than, than Duo. Uh, after uh, testing these two systems uh, for more than one year, the Digital uh, Research Alliance of Canada decided on Duo and is going to be implemented in the forthcoming months. Uh, uh, there, for, uh, if you, Google Authenticator, if you are to implement your own multi-factor authentication solution, because I have seen, for example, people who has implemented that in a private server, or even in a workstation, in a Linux workstation, uh, I have seen people that deploys uh, Google Authenticator as a second factor when accessing the, the, their own system. Uh, Google Authenticator can be deployed in Linux servers. It's a, an open source uh, uh, software. You just download it, it from, from GitHub and you install uh, um, you install the, the server part on your server or the, the machine that you are expecting to protect. Uh, on the client side, uh, users just have to download the Google Authentication app. Google Authentication app uh, is available in, in, uh, in the Apple Store for iOS devices or the Google Play for Android device. Basically, there is a, even if somebody still has uh, all the platforms uh, running in a, uh, in a cell phone, even there is a Google authentication app for those, uh, for those uh, platforms. Uh, Google authentication, uh, Google authenticator uses TOTP or one OTP. Remember one time password, uh, TOTP means time-based, one-time password. Uh, uh, that's, we already saw that uh, the one-time password is one of the factors that basically is something that you have. Uh, yes, as a information, uh, how does this one-time password works? In your 
in your cell phone, your smartphone, there is a seed, a little file with a key. That, that key, which is basically a string of characters, is called a seed. We see it because it's the one that generates the numbers. And the servers or, or the system that is being protected also has the same key in your name. So that key is associated to the user specifically. So what the, what the client application does, for example, the, my, my smartphone, is that it takes the seed and it uses that seed as a key to encrypt the time of the cell phone. So if, if there is, at this very moment is 12.31 on March 29th, that, that information is encrypted using that key. So you get six numbers. Uh, you get those uh, six digits and you type those six digits in the system that is authenticating you. What the server does is it uses your key to decrypt those, that, 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 uh, those six digits and then compare the time with the local time. Of course, the, there must be a, a, a little mismatch, but the little mismatch is only a few seconds. The few seconds that it took to you to write uh, your OTP. So if if the server is uh, is okay with that little mismatch, it will let you in. Uh, on the server side, you configure how strict you want to be for that mismatch. If you are very strict, you are not going to allow more than five, 10 seconds. Sometimes it's good to allow 30 seconds, 60 seconds, because the number is generated and the number, uh, that's why the number lives for, for only one minute because every minute the client application, the Google Authenticator or in this case, or even the Duo, takes the time of the, of the cell phone, encrypts uh, it using the, the key, the seed, and will give you this, those six numbers. In those six digits is the time of your cell phone encrypted. So it's, you don't need data transmission, nothing like that. Just uh, your, your client application will generate the number every time, every minute. Okay, well, this was fast. <laughs> Sorry. Um, any questions? <laughs>